John Finjurov, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, ditto. So, John, so you're from Russia, I understand. No, I'm from Greece. Uh, my parents are from Georgia, close to Russia. I speak Russian. Uh, people a lot mistake my last name. That's why they assume I'm from Russia. Ah, uh, okay. All right. So, wait, I didn't understand. Where are you from? What country? Uh, from Greece. From Greece? Yes, not the movie. <laughs> it's a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so you have a you speak Russian, but you're from Greece and you have a Russian name. Yeah, it's just my artistic name, the last name. Ah, so, gotcha. So yeah. do you do you, so when you say your artistic name, do you actually have another name? Yeah, yeah I was. It's not my birth name. It's like in Greek, it's Ioan Spenaridis. That's the Greek. It's the official birth name. And I like the English one, which is John Penerov. It's like catchy. Ah. And most people remember me by that name. It's not difficult to spell it at all. And I said, why not? Yeah, no kidding. That's awesome. So, yeah, I don't meet a lot of artists with pseudonyms, but I guess if your name is sort of hard to pronounce, that makes a lot of sense. So tell me about your upbringing and stuff. Um, were you born and raised in Greece? I was born in Greece and I was raised in Cyprus. It's close to Turkey and Greece. It's an airline in Europe. And yeah, I, I took interest in drawing when I was in Cyprus. I grew up here and I go to Greece when I can. <laughs> right. So how old were you when you discovered your love for drawing? Probably at five. <laughs> you know, when you go to kindergarten, they give you stuff you, for you to draw and that's when it clicks. Right. And you've been drawing ever since. Yes. And I took a break when I went to university. I studied graphic design and from there I chose to pursue fine art professional in 2016. No kidding. So were you, did you go to university in Greece as well? In Cyprus. In Cyprus. Okay. I'm going to get this whole <laughs> geography thing down eventually. <laughs> okay. Cyprus, Greece, Russia. I, it's all just a blur in my mind, but okay. So you were, you, you were raised in Cyprus, but you're from Greece with a Russian name. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I want to get this yeah, straight. Yeah, no, it's just difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get this straight. Okay. And you're currently in Cyprus now. Yes. Gotcha. That's correct. Gotcha. So at, where did you learn to draw? You have a, I, w I don't know if unique is the right word, but you have an incredibly beautiful style of drawing. Can you tell me a little bit about where you picked that up and how that evolved? Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. I admire your work as well. To be Thank frank, you. before I even discovered anything, I was looking at your work and uh, other people and I had like, you know, master copies. And I used to do them a lot, like Sargent. Uh, and I took some bits of elements from each of those artists and implement them as my own. But I got to credit everything I have learned from other artists. So, yeah, it's pretty much from master copies that I've learned and from looking at other works as an inspiration, not copying, because copying is something entirely different because if you do other copies of a living artist and you pass them as your own, people might get confused to like, whose work is it? Like, so yeah, what I'm saying that is that there are a lot of style similarities that you can confuse and I don't want to do that. Right. Uh, yeah. 
So it's mostly from social media that it's, that's the education nowadays. You learn through social media and it's a lot easier now than in the past. Yeah. So, yeah. That amazes me. When were you born? 1997. 97. Okay. So I was born in 74. So we're 25 years apart or 23 years apart. So yeah, you're right. When I was in school, social media didn't exist and the internet was in its infancy. And uh, it, it blows my mind to meet people like you who are grown men with an art career who learned mostly from the internet. Because that's just mind boggling to me because it was unheard of when I was your age. So I find that so fascinating. I mean, there's so much information out there. If you look at it, I think, okay, I'm going to say that learning from books is also a source of knowledge and connecting with other artists as well. So you can see from up close what to learn. And um, social media does not play a big role alone in knowledge. So you have to do some soul searching before you decide what you want to do for a lifetime. Yeah. Because a lot of artists at my age, they switch careers like so soon. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to adjust to a new job, to a new place. It's pretty tough. Yeah. When I was younger, I remember being in school and my, I wasn't satisfied with my teachers. So I'd go to Barnes and Noble Barnes. You might not be familiar with that, but that's an American bookstore. It's a bookshop. Yeah. Yeah. There were like two or three instructional books. I remember I got one by David LaFell, who's an exceptional painter. And then a couple, I don't even remember. I just dove into those books and tried to get everything I could out of them. It's just so much different now because there's so much out there, but you're right. It, it's, it doesn't make the artist. You still got to put in the work, right? To get to yeah. the level that you're at. So one thing that I find interesting about you, and it's kind of a strange coincidence because I just, I just interviewed Oliver Sin. Are you familiar with his work? Yeah, yes. I mean, he do this crazy. Yeah. I love his work. Yeah, he's, on, <laughs> he's amazing and he's an, an awesome human, but he also spends most of his time doing charcoal. And I find that, I find that really fascinating. Well, I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit. How did you land on charcoal? I mean, I expect you experiment with different things just like Oliver Sin does, but charcoal seems to be your main focus. How did you land on that and why? Well, first of all, charcoal is very delicate medium to work with. A lot of people see it as very easy to do from social media, <laughs> but it's very difficult to do it in, yeah. in application. So yeah, yeah, I'm trying not to spend too much time with charcoal because that deviates me from creativity and exploring various medium to work with. Um, it's you not know, just that, but also most of the materials are from America, so we don't have them here available in Europe. So, for example, when I want to try oil painting again, I have to order from overseas. Really? My materials and don't have access. Yeah, I mean, here we have mostly limited oil, which is smelly, and I have, like, respiratory issues. So, you want to work with something that's not hurting your health. So, yeah, it's, that's the one that I'm also exploring with watercolor. And before all that, I was just doing graphic design, you know, layout, composition, color theory. And then later, when I decided to become an artist, Everything I've learned about design is handful, useful, because in my work, I want to think like a designer before like an artist. So think of this as, think like uh, as UI and UX. So the UX is like the designer 
and the artist is like the UI. So it's like a bunch of aesthetics. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I you. think so. Yeah. So yeah, it's more. I'm headed more to like in a way of storytelling, narrating. I'm trying to go to a narrative way of work instead mm. of just copying, you know, for reference photos all the time. And when I do it, just, you know, trying to study just like the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing anything different. Right. Well, I don't know about that. I think you definitely have your own way of doing things. Your work is quite it's it's definitely your own. I mean, you you mentioned some of your influences, like John Singer Sargent. I don't particularly see him in your work, so you've definitely found your own voice. Let's actually go pull up some of your work here. All right, so this is a piece that I actually have. Uh, let me see, where is that down here? Okay, right here. I believe that's the yeah. same piece, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, um... Yeah, tell me about that. Tell me about what you mean by not, you're not just copying the reference, but you're thinking about design and story. Tell me a little bit about that. So before I try the, the classical way, you know, the classical, the classical approach to drawing, I used to do happy early. And over time, I tried to shift it to classical. So this particular work, I used to look up to KZ Bao. Ah, I, don't know I can that. see that. Yep. So, he, so yeah, you know, the start, the bridge, the pounder work. So I started with the pounder and graphite at lunch, and then I gradually built up the mass and the form to achieve this. The result, and I used like a bunch of material, like soft brushes, Charcoal, powder, charcoal. It's a bunch of soft brushes. Things. Did you say soft brushes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like what? What kind of brush? Like a sable brush or a synthetic brush? I think synthetic. Synthetic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. You're right. That does look like Casey Baugh. But then if I pull up something like this, this is different than the last one. This yeah. doesn't feel so Casey Baugh like. So tell me a little bit about this evolution. Um, this is digital work. Ah. Uh, a lot of people think it's a traditional, but I'm trying to apply a traditional way to make a digital work look traditional. Man, you're doing a good uh, job. You know, it just... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what to say. I just found your reference. I like it, and I wanted to play with delicacy, expression, you know, and not apply too much, you know, detail on the face. And... Hmm. You know, I've noticed that one of the things that you do a lot is you draw on location and you draw on a sketchbook, but your chosen medium is charcoal. I love charcoal over graphite personally, but I've never understood how someone could draw with charcoal in a sketchbook and not shut it and ruin your drawings. What What are you doing? Well, I'm doing magic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not magic actually, but if you research it, there are ways to prevent this magic. So you can uh, place a tracing paper in between pages or you can um, let it dry and use fixate it over and over again then use it another time until it could become completely dry and that's pretty much it but i think people a lot of people prefer to go with tracing paper and that saves a lot of time and some unnecessary spraying so do you just carry tracing paper with you when you when you travel? Um, yeah, not always, but when I do like a double spray drawings, I don't travel doing that. Uh, when I, I travel, I just pick up maybe graphite, 
and lightly pencil and enjoy the quick drawing sometime. Mm. Because something like that, what, what I'm looking at, the sketchbook it takes only three hours, four hours in studio, looking at the reference all the time. Gotcha. And studio works are like more convenient to me than going out traveling. I don't know. I know a lot of people prefer to draw from life, but I believe drawing from references and from life can achieve the same result and the same experience. But from life, you have more access to the model to see what they really look like mm -hmm. compared to flat poach or reference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. And I've noticed when I was looking through your Instagram that you do work from life a fair amount, even though you also work from reference. Like for example, right here, drawing this young guy, is this one of a relative? Yeah. It's just my nephew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great little drawing that you did of him there. So you are doing it, and I'm assuming this one then is in graphite. Yeah, uh, graphite. Okay, so yeah, so that makes sense because I wondered that. I saw these sketchbooks with charcoal, and I'm like, I only sketch with graphite when I'm out and about because charcoal is such a mess. And I thought maybe you had yeah. some secret that you could share. With that. But I guess I guess the tracing paper is helpful, so I, I appreciate that. And I'd really like to pick your brain a little bit more about your process too, because one of the things that you talk about a fair amount is that you mix mediums. You use charcoal and graphite often. I don't know a yeah. lot about that. I've never really experimented with that. My understanding is that if you put too much graphite down, charcoal won't even stick to it. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about that? What it is that you're doing there? Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. No. Uh, I would not advise people to draw with charcoal when they go outside. I mean, particularly with charcoal sticks, because the, the dust is blowing against the wind. You know, it's oh, messy. Yeah. The only exception you can do is drawing with charcoal pencils. Like general pencil, primo, ritmo, there are many charcoal pencils you can use. So my process when I use graphite, I use graphite very lightly with the grade two H or even H. Those are the lightest you can use, and I use them for um for my blocking process. And when I reach the final result after charcoal that, I can use them for half tones on the skin. And mm. again, can very lightly so it does not shine. Oh. So the more the more graphite you use, H B B and B the more to B for B. If you use them lightly and get the paper, you are not going to get a lot of shine. And that's the secret. Even if you use a blending stamp, after you use uh, the two edge graphite and you smudge it, it's not going to shine. So gotcha. I use that a lot of on half tones and that. People get mixed reviews on that. They have mixed views because they listen to the school teacher what they say when they have minimal experience with mediums with mixed mediums and having personal experience is a lot different again you have to do a soul search and, and explore various mediums on your own mm -hmm. to find a setting that you find to work that you are most comfortable working with right so you're laying it in then you're fleshing out after you lay in with charcoal and then you're getting the fine, I would, I would assume the lighter half tones with the graphite just to get some nice transitions and stuff with the graphite. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's helpful. I wondered about that. The other thing I wonder about is the temperature is the graphite 
and the charcoal going to be the same temperature or is one going to be warmer than the other? But in your drawings, it they don't, they seem like the same temperature. So there are a lot of graphite projects. So for this one, I use graphite and graphite, which is slightly different than, you know, fiber castle and other materials like statler. I like this because it's very smooth mm. and I barely use the graphite here. The only have graphite here is on the face. Mm -hmm. You can see that because it's very lightly used. If I use charcoal on it, it will have texture and it will be a lot darker than graphite. And it's harder to harder to erase after work. So mm. that's why I use graphite. So whatever you see dark on the hot tone, it's done with charcoal. Charcoal sticks and pencil. Gotcha. So that's how you're achieving those really, really subtle light half tones with graphite. That's how you're doing it. Yeah, that's what you can learn from hyperrealism. But I don't do the same process a lot of hyperrealists do like they do they go layer to layer and they render it like skin pores and all that. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. It's Did, too time consuming. Did you do that at one point? Have you tried photorealism? Um, you... Yeah, a lot of, yeah. And I hate it because a lot of people say it looks like a photo, it's Photoshop, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know it's, it's social media. Yeah, but social but media you know, loves it. Social media loves it. <laughs> Although social media loves you too. So I don't think you have anything to worry about, but I find it interesting how social media just happens to love the photorealism, but and you've tried it and then you've moved away from it. And is it is that the only reason? Because you feel like people are saying, "Oh, that's just a that's just copying a photo," or did you actually not have a taste for it? Um, uh, it's probably the second one. It's too time consuming. It can take more than seventy four hours for oh, a photorealism. You don't want to work like a week on doing skin pores or, mm -hmm. you know, hairstyle and stuff, you know, going for hair trend to hair trend or the eyelashes. Um, maybe just because I'm impatient with details and I just want to be done with it and move to the next drawing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you. Well, I prefer what you're doing over photorealism because I feel like I don't, this is just one guy's opinion, take it or leave it, but you have a photo, you just make the photo again, I just assume hang the photo, right? So, but what you're doing is making it more than a photo. Like, let's take this one, for example. To me, there's something more poetic about this than just a absolute precise copy of the reference. You're making artistic choices here. Um, thanks again, man. <laughs> I feel like I'm sharing with compliments. Um, uh, let me think about this piece when I've done it. I think I've done it before the algorithm was introduced on Instagram. And so I try to keep the likeness of the, of the person. And I am trying to implement a, a couple of photorealism, maybe, you know, the approach of photorealism, just to keep the focus on the face and every, let them. Uh... I just take a minute to recognize the people and companies that make this podcast possible. First, I want to thank you, my patrons. You are absolutely the most important and necessary sponsors of this podcast. Without you, we couldn't keep this thing going. If you love the show and are not yet a patron, please consider helping out. Go to theundrapedartist.com and click on the link, Be My Patron on Podbean. And then just pick a monthly amount that fits your budget. What are four great podcasts a month worth to you? In my opinion, my sponsor, Rosemary Brushes, makes the best artist brushes available today. They have a huge inventory and are constantly innovating and adding new and interesting brushes to their line. 
They ship all over the world, and due to their exceptional customer service, you won't wait long to receive your order. To order some brushes for yourself, go to rosemaryandco.com. The Hein Atelier began over 20 years ago in 2002. Due to limited space and high demand, in 2022, I adapted the entire curriculum to an online platform. While on our website and mobile app, students will find hundreds of hours of valuable recorded content, this online atelier is not just a website full of lessons, tutorials, and other resources. In this program, I personally mentor each student toward their artistic goals through weekly Zoom critiques, instruction, and regular in-app communications. To learn more or to sign up, go to Heinatelier.com. Lastly, whether you're watching or listening on Apple Podcasts or just listening on another station like Spotify, please consider leaving me a five-star review. If you watch on YouTube, consider giving me a follow and a thumbs up. These things really help the channel. And let everything else, you know, lose. Mm-hmm. Like on the hair, you know, like it's more like a camera and you try to focus on one thing and keep everything else just loose or blur, you know, fade away. And that's it. A lot of people like that. Uh, before the algorithm, there were a lot of people who liked it. Now it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. So, uh, tell me about your, a little bit about your lay-in process now too, because I noticed some different processes that you have here. Let me see if I can find them now. So you have this process where you're laying in light and dark shape to get to the likeness. But then at one point I also saw sort of, uh, like we had talked about earlier, an Oliver Sin approach where you laid in the planes of the head. Let's see if I can find that. Here's the one I'm talking and about. So now you've got this sort of Oliver Sin style versus that posterization or no tan style. Which approach are you most comfortable with and why? Um, in this approach, I am implementing the Azaro head and the Rally method. Uh, with a few adjustments and on this digital drone. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot easier to work with digital work because you have a lot of options. When you do digital drone, you can undo the rate easily. And I'm more comfortable with this. And this is only applying to digital work. Uh, okay. On the other one, with the, um, the captain, the old guy that I was with at three slides. Mm -hmm. That's more like um, with a bark method, you know, charred bark method. Yeah. And I'm trying to use only charred stick, no pencil. Just the only time I use pencil is when I'm trying to lay my blocking down. And that's it. Right. But in this one, and it's more than process. It's it, you're thinking differently. And this one, it looks like you're thinking more in terms of planes. Whereas the other one, it looks like you're thinking more in terms of light and dark shapes. Yes. Uh, this is more, um, trying to study the likeness and try to become more, um, you know, I just think it like this way you are trying to start the classical approach to achieve a photorealistic result. Mm -hmm. Instead of doing vice versa, you know, where you see photorealistic doing bit by bit, rendering small piece at a time. I just want to do it in all one setting and not spend too much time rendering it. And this is a lot convenient study the Azaro head and the Rally method. Uh, yeah, I, I was also influenced by Oliver Sin's work, where he does that a lot. Mm -hmm. In his workshop, in his bureau. So yeah, I think Oliver Sin plays a role in my process. Yeah. Tell me about why you enjoy doing digital work. I'm assuming 
well, maybe this is an unfair assumption, but I'm assuming you can't sell this. If you have time to do a charcoal drawing that you can sell versus a charcoal drawing that you have digitally that may, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that can't sell because it's not tangible. Why do you choose to do digital? Well, let's say for fun, uh, but you, can, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of ways to sell something like you can sell it for a print, you can sell it as NFT, but NFT crash, NFT market has crashed since the pandemic. So for me, it's not even worth selling NFTs anymore. But yeah, you can sell them as a print. You can. Online print. Yeah. And it's still a source of income for people who are trying to make a living with the various sources of income. Yeah. So I wasn't aware of that. So this is, this is really informative to me. I didn't realize you could sell digital prints. Again, I'm an old dude, man, 20, 20 something years older than you. So this is all new. This is all new to me. And I've done literally zero digital work. So I'm completely ignorant on how it, it all works. The only digital work I've done is for the, you know, things like this, where it's not actually art, it's, you know, podcasting type stuff. So thank you for that. All right. Here's a, oh God, this is gorgeous. Is this, okay. This is digital too right? Yeah, yeah. I'm starting yeah. to see it. I'm starting to, I'm starting to be able to interpret it a little bit. Freaking gorgeous. What, this is what I mean when I said earlier that there, this, you're doing more than just copying a photo and rendering pores because you're making these beautiful decisions where you have these lost and found lines and these little accents here and there that just make it so much more interesting to look at than a duplication of a black and white photograph. It's just absolutely beautiful. And then the, the, I have to say too, I love the simplicity of the lips. Maybe you could comment on that a little bit. You've got this really sharp eye here. And then these lips, it's almost like you lassoed this and blurred it out. Like it's that soft. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, that's the layers of digital drawing, you have a very, you have a variety and wide range of digital brushes, you like charcoal soft brush, you have a textured brush of charcoal, you have like a lot of brushes, you know, that you can use in Photoshop and try to replicate things in your own way and make them memorable, not just a photo reference. And that's it. I have even my own charcoal brush set that I've done from, you know, I've done it traditionally. I scan them digitally and I use my own charcoal brushes. And no kidding. So when you, you say you use, when you say you use your own charcoal brushes, do you mean that you created them with their own characteristics? Yep. Okay. Yeah. See, man, I'm telling you, I'm ignorant. Okay, so one thing I'd love you to comment on that's really hard to do is knowing where to put emphasis. I mean, it, maybe to some people it may seem obvious to put emphasis in the eyes, but it's not always obvious. But you've just got this incredible crispness in this one open eye and then softness in the mouth and nose. And then again, crispness right along the edge of the face. Talk to me a little bit about about emphasis and what's going through your mind when you're doing a drawing like this? So often when I'm social media, I notice a lot of people like models that smile, mm -hmm. you know, that give them a warm feeling. Like this lady here, she's smiling, the eyes are winking. And that's what most young people like. Mm-hmm. So when I'm drawing old people, whether I'm doing digitally or on paper, it does not get a lot of attention. And that's a bummer because I love doing drawing old people hmm. compared to young people. Because, you know, you draw those wrinkles on paper. They're so expressive lines. And this, in this one, I just, disregard the hard tones. You, you don't you don't see a lot of hard tones in the face. It's just flat. 
maybe on just on the cheeks that there is a little cartoons. Um, and I work mainly with dark shadows and then, you know, just smooth the shit out of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I love working with soft brushes, man. You, and then on top of it, I use crisp, crisp charcoal, uh, you know, and just trace it. So you start out very soft and then you come in, you accent it with some crisp lines is what you're saying. Yeah. Crisp is the last resort to what I'm doing in this process. Yeah. I could have done, I could do this also for the hair, but again, I would not enjoy the process of doing one line for each hair, you know, yeah, no. make it too much photorealistic. Yeah. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your career. I mean, tell me about that. How do you spend your time? Are you selling drawings? Are you teaching online? I know you have a Patreon account. Maybe you could talk to me a little bit about what that looks like. And the reason I want to know is because we live now in a day and age when it seems that you can make a career in so many different ways. So I'm really curious about how you're doing it. Um, yeah, certainly the social media and the internet is a lot easier to make an income now compared to 10 years ago or maybe 20 years. Uh, my main source of income is from Patreon, selling prints, commission works, and doing op online auctions. Online auction. Does that make sense? Yeah, what is yeah. that? What's an online auction? Uh, you basically list your work on Instagram. Uh, you let people bid in the comments. Oh, uh, okay. Who, you know, you know, uh, this is a lot easier than, you know, trying to get listed on Sony Paris or Christie's. That happens on in the blue, only in the blue moon. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to reach out to people that can that can afford my work. And this is not always easy because you have to research your audience because not everybody's rich. So you have to be reasonable with your prices and your work. And that's it. I have it I have not figured out the YouTube way because it's not available in my region to make an income from YouTube. From what? So yeah, from YouTube, it's not available in my. Oh, region. YouTube, YouTube. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So every day I'm trying to discover a new way to make a new account, make a stable thing, a stable salary, whatever. Uh, it's not always easy. And uh, in here in Cyprus, not everybody is respected not. So most of my clients are from America, Russia, Canada, UK. I have a lot more clients than here in Europe. Wow. Well, but, and I teach sometimes uh, in person whenever I'm inviting to a private workshop, not in schools. And uh, online on Patreon where I show people my process, like what we discussed today. In the video format, picture step by step mode. Mm. And that's it. So it's I really varied. You've got income coming yeah, from yeah. all different places. It's time consuming. It's costing your health. Trying to do everything <laughs> by you. Yeah. It's not always easy. It's... Yeah, you're right. I'm... Uh, life is great. That's good. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in this day and age, you almost have to do everything yourself. It's, it's, uh, it's frustrating. It's a blessing and a curse at the same time. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to go back to your art. Let's look at that a little bit more. And one thing also that I've noticed is that you often draw quite large. I'm assuming this is a show of your work right here. Yeah, it was last year in Moscow. Oh, last year. And how did this, uh, how did it go? 
it went great. Um, so I have done about eight of those large works. And I personally know all of those models. So you see John Carrasco in the middle, mm -hmm. you know, John Carrasco, yeah. And yeah, no copyright issues, nothing, just easy. And it was great. None of them sold stones. <laughs> they are too big to hang on the wall. Oh, what about. a disappointment. <laughs> yeah, I want to hang uh, in yeah. there. You just don't have the right audience right now. I, I, and have you thought about sending them to an American gallery? Uh, um, where did you start? Before the pandemic, uh, there was a gallery from Brooklyn, I think, or Queens, I don't remember. It's called, I think, George Berg Gallery. I haven't heard of it. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, when I discussed it with them about my work and this large work, they ghosted me after. Mm. But they are still running the the gallery. They have also a client like Hunter Biden, mm -hmm. and they got a lot of controversy after that. And no, I don't have a gallery. It's hard to find a gallery. Besides the gallery, want you to create specific work, the work that sell easy, so you don't have a lot of freedom doing what you love doing. So that's also one reason why I do not seek out the galleries. Well, that that's not always the case. My experience is it just depends on the gallery. Yeah. My experience has been there are two types of galleries. There are ones that are trying to find an artist that will appeal to the market that they already have and there are ones that are seeking after new talent the the ones that are seeking after talent seem to be more interested in creating markets than appeasing markets so yeah i wouldn't give up too early because uh there's i've had experiences with galleries i mean currently not in one i'm, I'm doing everything on my own right now but I have had positive experiences with galleries where they let you paint whatever you want and they work their tail off to help you to sell it. So they're out there. I'm positive uh, about this, man. I'm not giving enough. Yeah. But, uh, thanks about the pep talk. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, they're they're out there. And, and this work is, I could totally see some of this stuff in a New York gallery and, uh, there are people with huge houses and so much money that would probably kill to have one of your drawings like this on their wall. These are hard to pack, man. They're so big, you can't. Yeah, that's the it's hard part. It's not worth sending them at all. That's true. Yeah. That's challenging. Yeah. And drawings are fragile too, which is frustrating, I imagine. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So you said you were experimenting a little bit with watercolor. Do you have any of those in your Instagram here? Any of your watercolors? We do have an oil painting. Uh, Is this oil right here? Yeah. On paper, that's my news. Oh, that's Celebrating Greek independence. Thank you, man. I do have a watercolor, watercolor, but I think in just one or two, maybe. Really? Well, I just, I'm, I'm just, I'm um, enjoying looking at this right now. This face right here, how big is this face? It's small, about maybe 21 by 30 centimeters. It's pretty much more like a letter size. 21 by just 30 centimeters. So maybe like nine by 12 inches. Yeah. Something yeah, like that. That's better, yeah. Yeah. So that letter size. So that face is less than an inch. Yeah, right. you work with tiny brushes. Oh you my it. <laughs> gosh, that face is incredibly well painted. These these little heads are hard to paint. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, it was hard to work with. Yeah, yeah. You, the The trick is to keep them simple. Somehow you kept it really simple, and yet it still feels finished. That's really nice. And man, does that ever have a Russian feel to it? You brought out your name in that one. 
Definitely looks, it looks <laughs> Russian. Uh, uh, probably, probably Russian. Does it? Well, maybe the, I don't know. I'm talking about the paint quality, not the flag and the clothing. The paint quality feels Russian to me. I don't know. I haven't noticed that. Yeah. So you say you do or don't have watercolor here. What it, I do have, but maybe we scroll way down. Way down. All right. Let's see. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is this watercolor pencil that you're laying it in with? No, just a colored pencil, not anything specific. And then you try to work on layers and that's it. You don't hold but press the paper. Ah, and here and is here's the finished one. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this one because it's my second attempt on this specific piece. So I'm trying to achieve a likeness and the worth of quality. It's decent, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think it, it's what about you? What about me? I don't do watercolor. Do you enjoy watercolor? No, no, I hate it. <laughs> I hate it because <laughs> I understand. <yeah. laughs> I'm just so used to oil, and I just, you know, part of me fantasizes about doing watercolor, but it's hard enough for me to be decent oil painter. So, oh my gosh, this is oil, right? Yeah, it's oil for a client. That is and... gorgeous. I like that. And that's different. At least it, it, from what I know about you, this seems like a, you know, a little bit different than what you're accustomed to doing. How did this come about? Um, a client about client when she used to live in Cyprus. Mm-hmm. Shere village was occupied from the invasion years ago. And she wanted me to paint lemons from her village because that symbolizes her village. And she wanted to remember that group. She wanted to, yeah, lemon just symbolizes her village. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And she wanted me to paint the bunch of lemons. She sent me the photo. And I've done it in memory of the people that were refugees, that are refugees, refugees from that village here in Cyprus. And that's the story about it, nothing more to comment on. Really. Yeah. I got a comment, though. You're a much nicer guy than you look like in this photo. <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not smiling a lot. No, uh, yeah. you Trying look pretty to, pissed uh, off right so, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you know, trying to take a photo from September is always annoying. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> no, take that as a compliment. You're a much nicer guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, now that I'm scrolling down here, see, I didn't realize you had done this many paintings. You've got a lot more paintings than I was familiar with. Is this is digital. Uh, yeah. This is digital. Okay. Yeah, you're. Yeah. You, you do a lot of that. This looks like one of the models Oliver Sin drew. Yeah, that's John. And how yeah, did, how did that, you have access to this guy? Who is this guy? Uh, that's John Carrasco. He's a model from Bay Area, and we talk often where we discuss about the next drawings he sent me references for me to work with oh. and i like i like that and i done that when i was sick during the passover week uh, about last year maybe yet and that's the drawing that i exhibited last year in moscow it's one of those big works maybe 160 by 150 centimeters that is gorgeous. And he has such a physiognomy, uh, John Casper. He is easily recognized. Yeah, he is. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I love how l rough and loose the beard is, but then just around the edges, you suggest the little, little beard hairs that make the whole beard feel 
feel authentic. And then the eyebrows, these little gray hairs in the eyebrows. That's great. I love that. Nice details. Birds are hard to, to do. Are you doing that with a kneaded eraser or do you have some other tool? Um, uh, I use various. Um, I don't know what you are using. Uh, I use a kneaded eraser, a mono, mono zero eraser. Yeah, so I have those. Pencil. And the white chalk, mm. white charcoal, and a jelly roll pen, which is a wet media. Oh, ink. yeah. Is so? Do you have some jelly roll pen in this? Yeah, yeah. So it, they are only help, helpful to draw narrow lines that pencil can do because they look chalky and they blend. Right. You know, it make. It's not always correct. And the jelly roll pen sticks to the charcoal? Yeah. It, well, it depends. If you use fixated heavily on it, it's not going to stick for a very long time. Oh, okay. Because it's a wet media, so you don't have to use it. Just use jelly roll for the last resort where you are done. After fixing, after using fixed on charcoal and dry media, then you can use that. <clears throat> the, pen, the, the pen. Wait, the so you get the drawing done in charcoal and graphite, and then you fix it with fixative, and then yeah. you put the jelly roll accents in. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It sticks nicely. Okay. And then do you fix it again, or is the jelly roll no. permanent? No, you don't. Okay. It's permanent. No, if that's... you fix it, it's going to get ruined. It's going to give you a bluish, you know, muddle. It's going to give you a muddle look. Oh, really? It's not going. The fix yeah, it yeah. ruins the ruins the jelly roll ink. Yeah, if you do that over wet media ink, it's not worth it. It's more. It's much more like pastel. You don't right. fix it. Right. Okay. Oh, interesting that you know that about pastel. Do you do pastel as well? Um, no, <laughs> okay. I would love to try. Yeah, uh, I've toyed around with the uh, idea of that too. It's like a bridge from drawing to oil painting. Because there is a lot similar to oil painting. Mm -hmm. It's just a bridge to that medium. Yeah. Again, it has a different approach. And you have to dedicate a lot of time to be familiar with pastel. Uh, at some point, I'm going to sit down, read a book, watch some videos, and learn a new thing about pastel. Yeah, I oh, love that. Is, uh... So, so you're, I mean, you're basically self-taught. I mean, you, you've self-taught, self-directed lesson teaching because no one's self-taught, right? We're not reinventing the wheel. We're getting it from other people as yeah. you as you yeah. um, humbly admitted it earlier that you're getting this from other artists, of course. But I find that really refreshing that you can get to this level on your own, which information that's out there. It's impressive. And now, and, and are you, now you're saying, okay, I'm going to do, maybe I'll just watch a few videos and start doing, <laughs> start doing pastel. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. No, no. A lot of people should do that instead of just looking up to one guy who does the same thing over and over again. Because at some point, I'm going to just put down my charcoal and maybe do more oil paintings. Mm -hmm. Because in the market, they sell more than charcoal drawing. They I do. Believe. Yeah. They, no, there's no yeah. question. They definitely do. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I have a it's funny you mention that because I have a drawer full of art that I haven't framed yet. And it, even down to the framing, it's so much more of a task to frame a drawing than it is to frame an oil painting. With an oil painting, you just slap on a frame and hang it with a drawing, you mat it, put glass over it. You know, it's it's a little more tedious. But man, they are absolutely worth buying though. Absolutely gorgeous. Well, you know, with that, I'd like to ask you what 
advice you'd give some young people that want to become artists, you know, because you come from a different path. You're living in Cyprus where they don't even, as you described, don't even have good materials. You clearly figured this out by looking at other artists on your own. What advice would you give someone who wants to become an artist like yourself? Not to become an artist. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't say that. <laughs> Uh, you yeah, don't, I'm do you, joking, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, maybe if you live in America, where there are more art schools that can help you or guide you to become an established artist in the market, or Italy, UK, you know, West, all the West, and Russia, maybe, it's definitely worth to pursue an art career. So I would advise not to give up, not yet. Make research about the school they want to go, or they can use the internet to their own advantage. It's free. The information is out there. There are books you can buy. You can connect with artists. I will respond to emails uh, messages whenever I can. A lot of people ask me about materials. I also respond to those messages. You know, the internet is like a lot more easier now again. Mm -hmm. So, first thing is to research about what you want to do. If you believe you can do it because of the money, then you have to do some soul searching. It has to be about you. So if you love doing, then you can do a living on it. A lot of people just focus on money, like, you know, money, money, make a quick draw and sell it. And they think that's easy. You no, know, it's not easy. I would give any advice like you would to anybody. Again, start from classical drawing. It's very fundamental to know the basics. And from there, you go on your own. You don't expect anybody to drag them with you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm, good. I appreciate I that. That's... What advice will you give? <laughs> no, I give advice all the time. I think what you said was great. And uh, it's it's well appreciated. And it's inspiring that someone who hasn't had a lot of resources outside of the internet has come to the level that you're at. It's absolutely inspiring. So I appreciate you coming on the show. It was great talking to you. Great getting to know you a little bit better. Thanks a lot for being on the podcast, John. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to meet someone. It's an artist that I actually admire. Well, thank you. The honor is mine. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.